We've come at photon interaction already, but the way that electrons interact with matter is quite different. This is primarily because electrons have a charge, which allows them to interact with other charged objects from a considerable distance away, when compared with a photon which has no charge, which must more or less hit something directly in order to interact with it. The net effect of this is that photons interact relatively rarely with matter, but when they do they tend to interact violently and transfer a lot of their energy. Electrons interact far more often and usually transfer a lot less of their energy in a single collision. As a result of all these collisions, they tend to follow a fairly convoluted path through matter, being deflected over and over again. To illustrate the difference between the two, a photon with an energy of 1 mega electron volt can lose anywhere between none of and all of its energy in a single interaction. On the other hand, an electron with the same energy will interact around 100,000 times before it loses all of its energy. Most electron interactions happen like this. A high-energy electron passes a fair distance away from an atom, but its charge causes it to interact and push against a similar charge of a bound electron. The electron may be pushed out of its orbital, resulting in ionization, but in this case it doesn't go very far and doesn't cause much ionization in the surrounding material. There's not much energy transfer because the high-energy electron passes some distance from the atom, and the force of interaction and the energy transfer depends on the distance between the two things that are interacting. The atomic electron may also remain bound to its atom and may simply be lifted to a higher energy level, as an example of excitation, because there's not much of an energy transfer involved in this collision, is termed a soft collision. If the high energy electron passes very close to an atomic electron, it transfers a great deal of energy to this electron, and sends it shooting off through the surrounding material where it causes additional ionization on its own. This is known as a knock-on electron. Because there's a lot of energy involved in this collision, it's known as a hard collision. These are relatively rare when compared with soft collisions. Electrons don't just interact with other electrons. Atomic nuclei contain charged particles too. So if an electron passes close to an atomic nucleus, it can interact with that as well. This most commonly occurs in the form of elastic scattering, elastic implying that there's no energy transfer. In this case, a high-energy electron actually enters the atom and passes close to the nucleus. The attraction between the negative charge of the electron and the positive charge of the protons within the nucleus pulls the electron into a temporary orbit. 98% of the time, this electron is able to escape from this orbit without losing any of its kinetic energy, but it frequently results in a large directional change. It's because of these directional changes that these interactions are mostly responsible for the convoluted paths that electrons take when passing through matter. Much more rarely, though, the electron's not able to escape from its temporary orbit without losing any energy. Sometimes its interaction with the charge on the nucleus causes it to slow down slightly and lose kinetic energy. And remember that energy must always be conserved, so it always has to go somewhere. And like electrons always seem to do, it loses its energy in the form of a photon. This is known as a brehm strahlung interaction. It's a German word derived from their word for breaking, as in slowing down, which is bremsen, and their word for radiation, which is strahlung. So it literally means breaking radiation, radiation released in the process of slowing down. It's via this process that X-ray tubes and linear accelerators are able to produce X-ray beams. We do this by slamming a high-energy electron beam into a target material like tungsten. As it passes through the target, it undergoes the Bremsstrahlung interaction and produces photons. We use a high atomic number material like tungsten because the Bremsstrahlung interaction is much more likely when the atomic number is high. This is because the nuclear charge is greater, and therefore electrons passing through the material are more likely to interact with it. And you may wonder why we use tungsten instead of lead, which has an even higher atomic number. That's because while tungsten may not have as high an atomic number as lead, it is much more durable. So it's able to cope better with the stress of being exposed to a high intensity beam of electrons. The interaction is also more likely when the electron energy is high, so the production of X-ray beams is much more efficient when higher beam energies are used. This is why when using a CT scanner, for example, if you increase the peak beam energy, your patient will receive a higher dose rate even if you use the same beam current. When we were talking about photon beams and were able to discuss the relationship between the number of photons in a beam and the amount of material through which it's traveled, the relationship is more or less exponential. We also had a figure to describe how rapidly the number of photons varies with depth, which was the attenuation coefficient. But electron beams behave very, very differently. Rather than losing electrons with depth, the electrons tend to just lose energy. You might lose a few every now and then because they don't travel in straight lines. And you may also gain a few knock-on electrons due to hard collisions. But the number of electrons in a beam doesn't change much with depth until they start to run out of energy and stop moving. But electrons within a beam tend to lose energy continuously as they move due to constant collisions in a more or less linear fashion. This isn't rigorously true, but it is a useful approximation when thinking about the behavior of electrons. This is known as the continuous slowing down approximation. Now the rate does change a bit with beam energy, so it will change with depth, 
and it may also change if the beam passes through different materials. Also, Bremsstrahlung and knock-on interactions don't result in a continuous energy loss, since they tend to be fairly abrupt. But when discussing how electron beams behave inside patients, the continuous slowing down approximation is incredibly useful. Talking about the attenuation of electrons within a beam is not helpful, so we tend to think about what happens to their energy instead of their numbers. They tend to lose energy in a fairly linear fashion with depth, so we don't need an exponential attenuation coefficient. Instead, we use something more applicable to a linear energy loss, which is an electron stopping power, which is just the rate of energy loss, say in MeV, per centimeter traveled through a medium. The stopping power is a rate of energy lost by a beam due to all of the interaction processes I just mentioned during the previous slides. It tends to be a bit more useful if you split it into its collisional and radiative components. The collisional stopping power is the amount of energy lost by interactions between electrons within the beam and electrons within the medium. So the amount of energy lost by hard and soft collisions. The collision stopping power tends to decrease with the material atomic number, and it tends to have a more complex variation with energy than other quantities I've described in this series so far. It tends to be highest when electron energy is low or when it's very high. An explanation of why is beyond the scope of this series and not something you really need to know. It also depends on the density of the material through which the beam is passing. It tends to be highest when the material density is fairly low. This is called the density effect. Briefly put, when material density is high, the charges within the medium in which the beam interacts shield the beam from each other, so electrons within the beam are only able to interact with the material across shorter distances. The radiative stopping power is the amount of energy lost only via Bremsstrahlung interactions. So this is the amount of energy that's radiated as photon energy per centimeter traveled by the beam through a medium. It increases with the material atomic number and with the energy of the electron beam. Since, as I mentioned before, the Bremsstrahlung interaction is more likely under these conditions. An interesting fact about the Bremsstrahlung interaction that's important for understanding the rationale behind X-ray equipment design is that when low-energy electron beams undergo the Bremsstrahlung interaction, they tend to produce photons traveling perpendicular to the electron beam's direction of travel whereas higher energy electron beams tend to produce photons more often in the forward direction. I've mentioned a lot of times already that electrons tend to travel a fairly tortuous path through matter. Now, electrons with the same energy will normally travel the same distance through matter, but some will travel further in a straight line than others. We can't predict much about individual particles, but when we look at large numbers of them as we find in radiation beams, we can make very accurate predictions as to what the population will do as a whole. So beams will tend to travel a certain distance through matter on average. This is the electron range. It's not the maximum distance that an electron can travel through matter if it travels in a straight line. It's the distance that a beam travels through matter, so the average distance that electrons travel. It probably won't surprise you to learn that the electron range increases with the electron energy. It makes sense that if electrons lose a certain amount of energy per centimeter traveled through matter, if they have more energy, they'll be able to travel more centimeters, so therefore more distance. The range also decreases with the stopping power of the medium. So if the medium is able to absorb more energy from the electrons as they travel through it, they won't make it as far. Radiotherapy is all about doing damage to tumors. This is induced in the form of ionization. The amount of ionization that takes place inside a tumor, and therefore the amount of damage, depends upon the amount of energy that it absorbs. It's important to note that not all of the energy transferred to a medium via interactions is actually absorbed. Collision stopping powers tell us the amount of energy transferred to a medium by collisions. But some of this energy is transferred to knock-on electrons, which leave the volume in which they're generated. So some of that energy that's transferred to the volume doesn't contribute to local damage. If we look at an electron passing through a tumor, if it travels one centimeter through the tumor and has a collision stopping power of one MeV per centimeter, it's going to deposit one MeV of energy inside the tumor. If this is deposited purely via soft collisions, this energy will be absorbed by the tumor, and it will all contribute to local damage. If another electron with the same stopping power passes through and travels the same path length, it will still lose the same amount of energy inside the tumor. But if it experiences a hard collision and generates a knock-on electron as it passes through, a portion of the energy lost inside the tumor will escape, carried away by the knock-on electron. This energy will not be absorbed inside the tumor and will not contribute to damage. But a restricted stopping power, known as a linear energy transfer in the radiobiology context, does tell us how much energy a volume like a tumor will absorb as electrons pass through it. So while the collision stopping power tells us the amount of energy that's lost by an electron beam as it passes through something, which we could also call the amount of energy that's transferred to the medium, the restricted stopping power tells us the amount of energy deposited by that electron beam, or the energy that's absorbed by the medium per distance traveled.
Basically, this is achieved by calculating a stopping power that ignores knock-on collisions. So it's a stopping power that's only calculated to include collisions that transfer energy below a certain threshold. So the stopping power is restricted from including collisions with a large enough energy transfer to cause the energy to leave the volume. The various stopping powers describe the rate of energy lost by electron beams as they pass through things, but it can also be very useful to know how much electrons are scattered as they pass through things as well, especially for understanding how electron beams move through heterogeneous media like the human body. The electron scattering power, denoted by the letter T, tells us the average angular deflection in degrees experienced by an electron beam as it passes through something. As electron beams enter a patient, they tend to be moving in fairly straight lines, but as they travel deeper and deeper, they tend to be deflected more and more on average from their original path. The electron scattering power tells us how rapidly this happens with depth. It increases as the material atomic number increases, because once again there's more nuclear charge, and electrons tend to interact with it more strongly, and undergo more elastic scattering interactions, which are primarily responsible for these angular deflections. It also increases as electron energy decreases. This is because more energetic electrons are tougher to deflect. More energetic electrons tend to have more momentum, and objects with more momentum are generally more difficult to deflect. For example, try to imagine deflecting a tennis ball with your foot as it rolls along the ground. Now compare that with deflecting a bowling ball. One is clearly going to be more difficult than the other. As an example of how electron scattering power can affect electron dose distributions in heterogeneous media, if we irradiate something that has a low scattering power but contains an object that has a high scattering power with a beam of electrons, the electrons will experience more deflection within the high scattering power region. As a result, they tend to scatter electrons out into the surrounding region and therefore increase the dose around the object. This means that a lot more of those electrons will be scattered all the way back around and will exit the high scattering power medium as backscattered electrons. This results in a higher dose immediately above the high scattering power heterogeneity. More electrons are also scattered out to the side of the heterogeneity, resulting in adjacent regions of higher dose, known as hotspots. This is just a brief description of the effect of the electron scattering power on dose distributions. The actual effect of heterogeneity on electron beam dose distribution also depends on the stopping power and relative material densities. It's going to be covered in more detail in a later tutorial.